So hello, everybody. I am delighted to be here with Aiden Hart. Aiden Hart is an iconographer. He is a writer. Um, and for me, it's very personal because he's also, let's say, uh, someone who came before me as an icon carver, someone, someone who represented icon carving to an Orthodox world that, that had forgotten a little bit about that tradition. And so early, very early in my own career, I reached out to Aiden you know, for advice and for criticism. He was always very gracious to give it. But uh, beyond that, he has written several books on iconography. I would say the, the Bible of iconography. Um, and, uh, and he's also written about theory. He's done so many things. And so I'm very delighted and grateful to have him uh, with me today. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Aiden, thank you for coming to talk to us. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your honor of uh, finally having time with you. Exactly. I feel myself like knowing you so well through our correspondence, both here face to face, virtually, not really virtually, virtual, exactly, virtually, virtually. Yeah, several years ago, I had the hope of you know going to England and studying with you and doing all that things, but you know then then reality of being with the family and trying to set up a carving practice hits you uh, very hard. But um, maybe tell people a little bit about your, your story, because you are, in a way, a precursor to many of us, being some of, you know, one of, after Uspensky and that kind of very first seed of iconography, you were one of the first people to plunge in completely into the world of, of icons of sacred art and representing it to the world. So I, I, I want people to know a little bit about how you came to where you are. Thank you. I am. Um... Did my degree in English literature and um, also mathematics. Um, I, I've always loved the arts and the sciences, and this actually played out quite well later on when I became an iconographer. And then I trained as a teacher and left that quite quickly to follow my, my heart, really, and be a sculptor. Um, so I, I was in a high Anglican church, so I was aware of the role of art in general. But in my sculpting, I was searching for ways of showing the inner as well as the outer. I was very interested in bringing together the spiritual and the material. And I was looking for art that would help me do this. And I came to some conclusions how to unite the two. And then a friend of mine in New Zealand, I was raised in New Zealand, had just visited two Orthodox monks in New Zealand, one of whom was an iconographer. So I, um, I went and visited these monks and immediately I saw the icon I realized that the icon I've been doing for 2000 years almost, what I had been trying to do in my own little sculpting work. And um, plus a lot more, of course. And then I was really drawn to the monastic life and realized that behind the whole icon culture was a way of seeing, a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing God. Um, so to cut a long story short, I became Orthodox and um, ended up coming to England. I was born in England, um, though raised in New Zealand. So it wasn't a problem settling here. And because I had been a sculptor before I became Orthodox, I actually started carving. And then my parish priest suggested I also start to learn to paint icons. And it all grew from there, really. Um, I was able to, to go full time pretty soon, which allowed me to you know, dedicate my whole life to um, iconography, which to me is a form of prayer as well. It's not just um, being an artist. It's, I've always been interested in mission as well, about you know, knowing God as well as I can, but also communicating that to others. And I noticed through the icon, all sorts of doors open, like I've given talks at the British Library and places like that, where you could never be asked to talk about Christ, but you couldn't talk about icons apart from uh, talking about Christ in the secular uh, setup. So everything just fell into place very nicely, all these different parts, I mean, that had been a little bit separate or just naturally fell together. Mm. And you also, at the beginning of, of your work, you also spent several years on Marathos living as a, as a monk for several years. Uh, maybe tell us a bit about how that fed into your work as well. That's right. Um, I was really, I'd always been attracted to the monastic life, even before I became Orthodox. And my original, original intention was to join the monks in New Zealand as a, as a novice. But while I was overseas, they suggested I travel overseas a bit before returning to them. Things changed for them. Um, they had to move into the city to look after parish. So I stayed in England and there was a nun in the parish I was in. And um, so there were a lot of monastic services. Um, 
And I really wanted to join a monastery in the English speaking world, but at that stage, the door wasn't open at St. Sophonie's Monastery. So um, um, I thought, well, Papiathos is the only place. So I went to Greece to study modern Greek first. Bishop Callistos, my spiritual father, suggested that I study the language first. So I was taking one step at a time and really intended to go to Athos, slightly with a sad and heart because I really wanted to be in the English speaking world. So after studying for a year, I went to um, back to England to arrange my affairs and um, ended up staying with Father Barnabas, the Welsh monk, and joined him as a novice. Um, uh, so I was with that three years. And then I think he found it hard to have people with him. He wanted people, but being old and that, he found it hard. So the bishop said, well, it seems you've got to move on from there. And land was bought in, New in England for me to be a hermit. But it was at that point, my archbishop sent me to Mount Athos for training not to stay there, but for training before settling as a hermit here. So I was there about, I don't know, just over a year and a half with my beloved abbot there, Father Vasilius um, of Himbaventry, and I uh, then came back and lived as a hermit for about six years. But every year went back for about a month to Averon Monastery, which was my monastery at Athos. Um, so for six years, I would say living as a hermit, but in fact, <laughs> as I say jokingly to people, if you want to live a quiet life, don't be a hermit. People find out about there's a hermit on the hill, let's go and visit him. So it's a pretty tiring and social life sometimes. But, um, yeah. mm. One of the so things I was, you... Go ahead, sorry. sorry. No, no, sorry carry on. no, I because I, I, was, I was trying to, to think about some of the things you talked about in terms of uh, wanting to be in the English-speaking world. And I think this is something with really... which really characterizes your work as an iconographer is a desire to both meld into the universal tradition, you could say the universal imagery of iconography, but also try to adapt it, to transform it, or to connect it, let's say, to the place where you are, let's say the, the English speaking world, its own tradition, and try mm -hmm. to connect it. I think that's one of the most important aspects of your work, and maybe tell people a little bit why you think that's important to do. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's true. Right from the beginning, I felt, well, Christ was incarnate on earth and not just incarnate in the world in general, but um, the whole Christian life, I think, is, is an extension of an incarnation. So you know, I'm British. I, I'm not from, from Greece. Um, you know, Greece has in many ways retained that icon tradition, but I feel my job as a Christian is not just to introduce Byzantium into Britain, but to... Um, resurrect the, the icon tradition of Britain. Um, so I think it's both theological, but also pastoral. I think if people think that orthodoxy is sort of an, an exotic import from Greece, then it's not really reflecting life with Christ um, accurately. You know, life is with Christ, me, aid and heart as a, as a, personal, as a personal experience. And I'm, I'm British, I'm not, I'm not Greek. Um, so I, I think, it, theologically, it's really important, and also historically, um, it's always happened that the icon tradition has gradually expressed itself in a unique way. It always struck me how Russian, Russian churches initially were quite Byzantine, they had a rounded dome, but then gradually they developed the onion dome, partially perhaps practical reasons to shed the snow, but partially they felt that that expressed their experience of God more accurately than, than the rounded dome. They extended the drum. They did all sorts of things. So it's identified the Orthodox, but it's Russian. You wouldn't get that in Byzantium. Um, so uh, fortunately in Britain, we, we have a long tradition of, of, of early sacred art that is in the Orthodox sort of ethos, um, the Romanesque in particular to my mind. So quite often, if it's appropriate, I, I've drawn on that. So for example, the church where my parish is, um, it's a seventh century, eighth century foundation. The church itself is about 13th, 14th century. So when I frescoed the East Wall, I drew heavily on some um, uh, illuminated manuscripts uh, from what's called the Berry St. Edmund Gospel. Uh, it wasn't a, hopefully a pastiche, wasn't just a straight copy, but it was clearly influenced by that. So when people visit it, they realize actually this church is Orthodox, but it's also British. You know, the, the iconography reflects that. Mm. And what is your approach? Because I think this is my, one of my big concerns is to create something which is uh, both tra traditional, completely traditional, completely soaking in the language uh, that has been given to us, but also, like you said, not a pastiche or not uh, something which is a nostalgic piece of art. And it's, it seems difficult to find the line between the two, but I'm wondering if, if 
what is the approach that you have to be able to create something which is both traditional and authentic at the same time? I think it's an enormous challenge. In, in some ways, we can say that the icon tradition has revived after a time of decadence, if you like, both in Greece and Byzantium. But I think we're still incredibly immature as a sort of a, a orthodox iconographic culture that we don't really understand the timeless principles well enough to do this well. I think people like yourself and the Orthodox Arts Journal are exactly on the right track. And that we know what you're trying to do, but I think it's going to take a few decades for us to really understand those timeless principles. So, as you say, we're living within the tradition, uh, we're adopting a pastiche, we're doing something, something that's authentic. But to do that, we need to not only just know in our heads those timeless principles and therefore what can be changed, adapted, but we've got to be in it. So, I think I feel myself, I'm still learning a second language, you know, it's not my first language. So. So I'm, I'm happy with some of the things I've done. I'm so aware that I'm, I'm speaking a second language. So I think the first thing is just to be intelligent, you know, not, not to be scared, not to think, oh, yeah, I've got to copy something from Moscow, 15th century iconography. If I do anything else, I might get all decadent. You yeah, know? for the rest On of the my life, hand, I'll you know, copy these. I made and hug and do my own thing. You know, that's the other extreme. But both extremes, I think, are, are extremes. So I think it needs a lot of intelligence to sort of think, well, you know, actually, what is essential? Um, and, and what can I draw from in my own culture that is usable? I was talking to one of my students yesterday who's not from Norway, and her husband is an Orthodox priest. And Hannah was thinking of doing a doctorate on um, how to develop, say, an, an icon screen appropriate for Norway, drawn on the Norwegian folk tradition. They have amazing folk patterns they paint on their wooden churches, and they've got the stave churches. The stage church as it stands probably doesn't express the orthodox liturgy well enough, but one can start with that and then adapt it. So I think the more and more people are thinking like this, um, you know, we're fully in the tradition, but love their culture, feel that a lot needs to be redeemed and completed and, and show that, you know, Christ is incarnate now in Norway or Brisbane or Canada or the US. Yeah, and I think this is what you said is, is very important because there's a we have a tendency to have a, a kind of duality, which is on the one hand, we, we, we find people who are really attached to their culture, almost in like in a nationalistic sense. And they feel like this is the, the thing they need to grab onto in order to, to survive, you know, in this, this chaotic world. Uh, so we have this extreme. And then the other extreme we find are people who want to deny all particularities and, and see it as suspicious, you know, see it as idolatrous and everything. Um, and it, it seems like, this breathing in and breathing out, let's say, between how God is the source of our identity, but that we have to be careful not to be attached to these secondary identities, but see them through the lens of Christ, let's say. And that's when they actually take their, their full color. That's when their, their true colors appear and their true value appears is when they're submitted to something higher, submitted to something which is beyond it. Um, and I know you've had some insights into that, let's say, in terms of, uh, in terms of, of iconography. Um, and so, as I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm a bit selfish because I'm asking this in a way that just for me, you know, there is a temptation also, this is a temptation that I have. I don't know if it's a temptation or if it's, a, if it's an appropriate desire because we live in a world where we have all these images. We can, we can go online, we can find images from, you know, the catacombs to Russia, to Greece and everything. Um, it's difficult not to have this mosaic in the back of our minds, you know, as, as, we, as we work. And so, and for myself, also living in America, where we have this strange collage of culture. So I'm French, right? My first language is French, but I live in Canada. And, you know, I live in America with all this English speaking world. Um, and so there's also, in me, at least, there's a desire to create something which is synthetic is the only way to say it, which is particular, but also draws not only from, let's say, I would draw from the French Romanesque or from, but also kind of pulling in little threads from, from the Scandinavian world, you know, from even from Coptic icons and pulling them together to create something which is moving towards synthesis. So I don't know if there's something of that that you find that, if you find it's a dangerous way of working or if you think that it has some value. That's a really good, really important point you're making, Jonathan, because as with most things, the strength is a potential weakness. Um, but the fact is we do live in a world where all these different icon styles, traditions, uh, available and 
even impinge themselves on us, whether or not we're likely to expose to all these things. So it's a fact. We can't pretend that it's not a fact. So I think we've got to be real and think, well, this is going to affect us, and that's a good thing. So the next question is how to make it authentic, um, you know, how to um, have it come within a living experience, from within a living experience, rather than just, just be a gluing together arbitrarily. How to do that? I really think ultimately it's only living the life of Christ and the church. So you've got that sort of music. We have that music of heaven in us. And it's only while we're making all these millions of decisions, when you're carving something, painting something, designing it, every little choice we make, it's got to consciously or unconsciously be decided against that music within us, that, that, that um, experience of the life with Christ. And if it jars with that enemy, you think, no, I'll, I'll leave that aside. But if it corresponds with that, then we can use that element of Norway or Egypt or whatever. Um, I don't think there's any um, formula we, we can use. And, I, and I, I think it's just living that life in the, in, in the community of the church, living a life of prayer. Because in the end, liturgical arts got to support worship and awe and thankfulness and joy and humility and compunction. Um, and as we experience that ourselves, we'll make the wrong decisions. Um, so I think, I think in summary, we do live in this postmodern age. <laughs> We're exposed to all these things. And I think it's only natural, um, whether or not we do it consciously or unconsciously, that what we make is going to be affected by that. But we've got to measure it against that experience of prayer. Does it support it? Does it support a the right virtues or does it make us noisy inside and confuse us mm. and so i mean that brings me also to another thing that i've at least experienced in myself as i'm working because there is also a desire to be you know let's say how how can i say this there's a desire to impress in the sense that we want like i want to make the best image possible mm. and i'm always on a line between you know making something which is amazing uh, so that I can impress others and then saying to myself that I'm doing it for the glory of God. Um, but it's not always true, right? It's not, sometimes I, I just, I just know that if I do it this way, it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be impressive. Uh, and so for me, at least, you know, in, in light of what you said, I think I struggle with that quite a bit as well, trying to, uh, to find the balance between being technically proficient and having something which kind of embodies this music or this kind of living music that you, that you talk about. Um. Yes, and this is one thing that Father Vasilius, the abbot of Averon, taught me. He had this lovely term, there's a perfect imperfection and an imperfect perfection. So, and there was a wonderful exhibition of, of, of Byzantine icons that came to the World Academy in England a while back. And um, in the very last room, there are um, quite a few icons from Sinai, um, festival icons I remember in particular from about the 12th century. And what struck me was how free and messy they were. And but at the same time, incredibly beautiful. And you get the impression that the person who painted was like a prophet and the word of God was in his soul and burning in his soul. And he just had to get it out. He wasn't too bothered about, you know, putting every toenail in and that. It was done with great skill exquisite skill, but they weren't bothered about the little details, the buildings were a bit wonky, but you felt the spirit come through, whereas I've seen a lot of icons that are made with consummate skill, but somehow the skill encrusted the spirit, it didn't embellish the spirit. Um, so you notice the skill first and not, and not the spirit. So um, I'm very interested in the approach of the Japanese traditional Chinese painters, and I've done a few articles on um, elements of, of the philosophy of the painting, especially from a book called the um, Mustard Seed Garden Book of Painting. And one thing they say there is the different stages. First is to gain great skill, consummate skill. And the top though, is to discard skill and just express the, 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 the lie, the, the inner essence of things. Of course, the skill comes through, but um, it's like your first language. So you don't have to think about grammar because it's part of you. So I think a lot of us, I mean, there are a lot of people around who don't even have the skill. They're just, they're just really badly painted icons. Then you get the next level, highly skilled, but you're weighed down by that skill. The highest level, like Theophan the Greek, his frescoes, just, here's a prophet speaking, the word of the Lord burns out. It's a burning bush you're looking at, not a, not a topiary bush or a nice and clipped. <laughs> 
so it's that fire we're trying to communicate. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you you see, I think you know, I there there are some artists right now like that seem to have kind of this internal. I, I'm thinking of Cordis, of course, but Cordis who has internalized the language so much, you know that like you said, it's not he's he's not in the second language anymore. It's not something he's learning. He, it's become his own inner grammar, and mm. so when he's working, there's there's both kind of this deep tradition of the church, and there's also an idiosyncratic aspect to it which is just him just doing it. And when you mm -hmm. watch him draw something and he just goes right in and there's no sketch and there's no measuring and the, it just goes straight. There is something about this Chinese approach where, you know, mm -hmm. once the skill has been mastered and centered, then there's almost a letting loose or, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a capacity to just do without thinking, without planning. Um, mm -hmm. And you almost, it's almost, it's suddenly there's something theological about this idea too, that, that the idea of will or freedom, we tend to think of it as deliberating. But if you're mm -hmm. truly in this music, you know, truly in this kind of this, this song that you have inside of you, there is no deliberation. There's just action. There's just this, you know, the, a straightforward manifestation, let's say, of these higher things. Um, I think there is that, but at the same time, there must always be sobriety and you must be listening more than mm. speaking artistically. Because had the blessing of knowing some saints, uh, Saint Piusius, a bit Father Perfidius, a bit Saint Solomon, Saint Sophoni rather. And I noticed um, they wouldn't always answer immediately. You felt that there were tons of things they could say, all of which would be true technically, but they would listen and then speak and it was just precise. It was just, just the right thing that was said. Um, so I think um, you can get highly expressive uh, by choreographers, but to me, it's too expressive. Okay. Um, there's a story about um, some some highly educated people looking at a, a painting in the wall. I think it was an icon, but I don't know what icon it was, but they were just saying how alive it was and how wonderful it was. Then a, a, a peasant lady was overhearing this, and she said at the end, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation, and um, may I say something? She said, of course. You know. She said, I don't think this is a good icon because it's too alive. In other words, it was... <laughs> It was too noisy. It's too much full of itself. Mm. It's like a charismatic person that swamps everyone else. And you think, oh, what a charismatic person. But it's just that person. No one else is in the room. So that was interesting. You know, wasn't that quietness. So I think that's the amazing thing about like Theophan the Greek. You know, he could be highly expressive in his frescoes. But then you look at his panel paintings and he's really quite gentle and quite highly worked there. And he knows how to be appropriate in each situation. Mm. So I think it's it's really it's sometimes difficult to get the balance, but yeah, there is this expressiveness, but it should be quietness as well. Yeah. So you're not aware of all oh, that artist is so free, you know. Yeah. You're, you're not talking about the art rather than the, the saint. You know, mm. I want people to forget my icons. And if you're talking about the same type of thing, then, you know, that's the important thing. That's when you know it's work. No, I, I totally agree. My I had the chance of having my first experience as, as a commission. You know, I, my uh, bishop asked me to make a Panagia for him. And that was the first time I was getting a commission. I had no idea how to make miniatures. I had no, I, you know, I, I was just, just thrown into this. And so I, I found someone, uh, a Serbian carver that I had exchanged with, and he guided me through making this, this little thing. And I was so obsessed with the technical part of it, trying to get it right, trying to, you know, to, to have it, you know, and he, he was Serbian, this, this uh, iconographer, uh, George Bilak. So he was ruthless with me. He was just ruthless. He was he kept insulting me as I was making the icon. It was wonderful. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I worked on this. I made this thing and I brought it to uh, to my bishop. Uh, and all I was thinking about was if I had done it properly and I, he, he, he took it, he unwrapped the, the little icon. And when he saw it, he crossed himself and he bowed. And then I was just I was floored and I realized, OK, this has very little to do with me. Like, you know, I am a vehicle for something much bigger. And yeah. that's when it that's when I knew I wanted to be an iconographer because I thought, you know, Picasso will sell his work for millions and millions of dollars, but no one will kiss his icons. Well, no one will kiss his paintings. No one will venerate them. And the only thing I have to give up is the credit for that to happen. And I was like, okay, I'm willing to do that and just be hopefully be as much as I can a vehicle for for the saints that are that are being represented. But uh yeah, yeah. yeah. That was that was my first experience as, as a commission. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I wanted to, to, um, to shift a little bit 
and talk a bit about culture because many of the people watching this are people who are just interested in culture, where it's going. One of the things that we have in common and that I've seen in your writing and in your work is a desire to not want to completely oppose the world of sacred art and the world of secular art of secular culture, but rather see them as that they say the sacred as the source of the secular and the sacred as something which can feed into other arts and, and become a, you know, like a light for, for, for culture. And maybe I, mean, I, I know people would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Okay, yes. Yes, it's interesting. When I was a sculptor um, in New Zealand before I became Orthodox, I was looking for art that helped express this sense of otherness. In, I just wanted people not to see a face. I was interested in faces primarily, but as it were, the spirit behind the face. And Bancusi, funny enough, as I was into quite sort of um, naturalistic sculpture, Bancusi really um, seemed to me very profound. And um, I realized gradually that behind the incredibly um, refined work was actually the Orthodox liturgy. He was actually a chanter. Um, in, in, the, in the Orthodox choir, he's Romanian and, and sort of rose out of the Romanian uh, culture. And then you look at his uh, endless columns, all these things were actually rooted in, in liturgical culture. The endless column was uh, inspired by endless columns, which were um, over gravestones so in memory of people. That's like the soul ascended to heaven. Um, and, and the other thing that got me on this track was the vision of Ezekiel, where he has a vision of uh, a temple and an angel is showing him around. And then from underneath the altar of the temple runs a river and wherever the river goes, it brings life. So I thought, well, the worship of the church, the, the whole liturgical symphony, if you like, is the source. And then it's not a fountain that goes up in the church and comes down again. It's a river that flows out into the world and wherever it goes, it brings life. So I thought, well, if a culture is falling apart, it's because it's worship is blocked. You know, there's no river flowing out. And so going back to Bancusi, a lot of his aphorisms are to do with this. He said, my studio in Paris is just an extension of the monastery, and he names the monastery of his village in Romania. He talks about simplicity and complexity resolved. Um, all these wonderful pearls of wisdom you know, sort of come out of the whole Orthodox culture. So um, I think we're, a lot of scholars are beginning to realize that early 20th century modernism abstractionism actually had a religious inspiration. And you look at Kandinsky, again, actually he was Russian, a lot of his insight is from um, orthodoxy. For him, abstraction wasn't to depart from reality. We tend to think of abstraction as departure from reality. For him, it was to distill the essence, to abstract, to draw out the essence of something and depict it visually. And this is just what an icon does. You know, you're, you're indicating the fire of God within. Um, and then, of course, Bancusi was the father of um, uh, modern um, abstract art, Kandinsky, the father of, of modern uh, abstract painting. Um, and, and these came out of religious roots. Then all that was forgotten, and now we just sort of play around with this abstraction. They actually forget what they're trying to do. Whether one likes their art, um, that's what they're trying to do, to, to abstract and reveal the invisible. So I, th I think... Um, uh, liturgical art, and unfortunately there are a lot of zealot orthodoxy sort of write off any other art, but I think healthy art um, in the world that isn't liturgical but feeds the soul, like Dostoevsky's writing, I, I think of his in this category, I've dubbed this um, threshold art. It can help to bring us to the threshold of the church. Um, in fact, the man who baptized me, Father um, Ambrose in New Zealand, he came to Christ through Dostoevsky. He was studying um, Russian literature. Um, so he sort of wasn't ready to go into the church in the fullness, but he touched the hem of Christ's garment by reading Dostoevsky and then went further and then looked up and there was Christ looking at him. And so how, I'm curious to see, because I think a lot of people will see that in principle, let's say, we'll see that in principle. Uh, and so are there ways that you are seeing this happen today? Are there some places or some areas, some art or some literature that you feel that you're, or ways in which iconographers are able to maybe help or feed into this? Because I know a lot of people have that desire and we see it, like Dostoevsky is of course an example, but very few of us are Dostoevsky, sadly. Um, okay. You know, it, Do you see places in the world where this connection can happen? 
for the question. I, I don't know about places, but it's more international communities. Like I think Orthodox Arts Journal is really important because it's trying to um, work toward a fresh, uh, authentic understanding of tradition, but it's not exclusive in the sense that it has this sort of openness to liturgical art being a leaven to inspire healthy secular art in the positive sense of the word, or what I might call gallery art or threshold art. So I think um, it's not so much places, it's, it's sort of places of culture, of thinking, of a way of thinking. Then there are individuals who can be in, inspiring. Um, there's a thing called the Orthodox Arts Festival, which just went online briefly. And so they've got a category for iconography, a category for also just writing, you know. So I, I think there are some writers there who are doing short stories. So I think there are online um, uh, experimental bodies, as it were, for people to try things out and get honest feedback from other people. Um, as Orthodox Arts Journal has been, you know, there, 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 there's um, openness for genuine professional caring response to people. So you can iron sharpens iron, as it were. Um, I, I've always had this long-term dream of, of a liturgical art center where you're training people in liturgical art, but also we have conferences and meetings for those who feel perhaps they're not called to be liturgical artists, but you know, perhaps they're composers like John Tavern. I knew Sir John Taverner very well. Um, he wasn't really good at liturgical music on the whole. Sometimes he got it right, but his role was actually to be in the world and as it were, be like a horse of Troy, sort of smuggle the sacred and the profound into the world. Um, so that, that's been my sort of dream. I don't think it'll happen in my own lifetime. I've worked with Prince Charles a bit and trying to have something happen. And my, my liturgical art um, three-year part-time course is part of that. But I just love to have a, a centre where there's that buzz where people can come and share ideas. A bit like the French cafe was during the 20th century where they'll discuss ideas. But a centre where there is a church, where there are different serious liturgical art training programmes, apprenticeships, but also we, we have artists who are not just Orthodox, but Christians who feel that their role is in the world. I think this, I think this idea has been buzzing around now for 10 years, you know, and, and I think that it's slowly starting to show fruit, you know, in, in the US. Uh, Andrew Gould is also working on something similar that the Antiochians here have this, these ideas. And so I, I think we just need to be patient and, and yeah. slowly work towards something like that uh, happening. You know, um, people have also talked about here, you know, people talk a lot about Terrence Malick as a place also where this type of, where there's in, with his recent movie, A Hidden Life, where you really get this, this desire to create, uh, I don't know, to visually show in a movie, a, a, a Christian experience, you know? So I think, I think that there are definitely places where where this is happening now, um, I guess I'm going to turn the tables a little bit and ask you, there's also a very experimental iconography going on right now. And so on the one hand, we have this sense that, that uh, liturgical art and the power of, of our traditions can infuse popular culture, but there's also the, the things happening both ways. And so I, obviously I don't want to name iconographers. This is, it's important to, I want to avoid polemics, but do you, I, I've seen a lot of icons that present themselves <clears throat> as icons, but go very far in integrating either modernist or even postmodern aesthetics, you know, um, effect, I would call it something like that. And so do you feel like sometimes that can also go too far or do you see it as a, sometimes I see it as a laboratory, like there's, there's this bubbling mm -hmm. on the edges and it's mm -hmm. not going to continue. It's just going to be idiosyncratic, but a little bit of it will enter into the tradition and follow the kind of enter into the stream but I don't know if you have some perceptions about that type of work happening. Yeah, it's a very important point you raise, Jonathan. I think the two sides to it, I think there needs to be a certain freedom and fearlessness and experimenting. Um, it depends partially on what spirit that experimenting is done. You know, is it to show off my ego or am I genuinely trying to make liturgical art, iconography, composing, whatever it is that helps people get closer to Christ? Um, but because I wanted to be authentic, um, you know, I've got to try some different things. So that's, fi that's fine. I think life in Christ shouldn't be dominated by fear. Um, and you throw these things out there, and if they're not quite right, they'll just die a natural death. So I think there is a part for certain, a place of certain experimentation. On the other hand, I think um, you get to a certain point, we're experimenting with things that you're playing with fire. You know, experiment as an artist, 
um, that, that don't put it in front of people saying, no, you try to pray with us, you know? So I think, I think some iconography there, I just think it's just too, it's great. I appreciate it as art, but don't pretend it's an icon. I think it's just going a bit too far. So I think um, on the one hand, you have people who say iconography is not art. I think it is art. It's much more than art, but it's at least art. In other words, it should have a beauty or harmony. But then some of this contemporary iconography, I think it's just getting a bit too um, arty. And lovely yeah. as art, um, you can't, it's got to be taken on a case by case basis, I think. Um, and so one of, one of the things that I think is happening, and this is difficult because, you know, we have we have a sense the modern man has a has a feeling you could call it you know the the, the shock of the new or the mm -hmm. the effect of novelty and that the effect of novelty has a surprising element like when you see it it surprises mm -hmm. you and it creates a certain a certain sense that a certain sense of wonder you could call it and to to be fair to it and so i think that what i'm seeing in a lot of the a lot of the more experimental iconography there's a danger to confuse, let's say, this deeper, this deeper encounter that you talked about, the stillness of encounter with the icon, uh, to confuse the experience of shock of the new and this kind of surprise, because it's there's an elation in that surprise, uh, and it makes you want to even on the in the online world world especially because you want to get attention, and so you people will share an image of an icon which is slightly askew because it'll be able to gather, get people's attention quickly as they're scrolling down their Facebook feed. Uh, and so I, to me, I, I see that there is a little bit of a danger to confuse the, the, the experience of novelty with the deeper, you know, encounter with the sacred, the sacred, I don't know, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think if we look at, if we look at nature, um, things adapt by very slow increments. You know, if, 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 if environment changes, you'll find that nature begins to adapt slowly, bit by bit. Yeah, there's a mutation, most mutations are, are, are not useful, but the odd one is useful. Very rarely do you get something, you know, there's a bird suddenly grow four wings. Um, so I, I think in our time, um, we need to move toward a more, more authentic Western iconography by small increments. That, that's how I approach it. You know, I'm, I'm not a particularly great paint to myself, I've got to move very slowly and gradually, gradually I adapt. Um, there are some people far better than I, you can, 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 can move more quickly, but it's just my insufficiency that I, I just work in very small increments. Um, and and I, I, I think, you know, some of the works as you suggest are, are just a bit, a bit too shocking really. They're just jumping too far ahead of themselves as well. Um, but on the other hand, I think just to do mindless copying it might be safer, but I think it's a bit dangerous because basically we're saying life with Christ is, well, it's like the, the man who buried his talent. He buried it because he was afraid. Exactly. The and took a risk. You yeah. know, they, they, they invested their two talents, five talents. They took a risk. It might have failed. <laughs> but they thought, well, you know, this my master trusts me with this money, so he must believe in me, so I'm going to take a risk and invest it, and hopefully it will increase, and it did. But the one who only had one, he was afraid and he buried it and he was told off. So I think just mindless copying is actually acting out of fear. And it, it's it's fascinating because the we talked about the world of technology as creating this mosaic of of images, you know, and this this constant novelty and this constant change that that it's difficult for it not to attract us. But the same technology is what is making it possible for people to just slavishly copy, you know, mm. 16th century Russian art because we have these high resolution pictures that people can have in front of them as they're working. You know, the ancient yeah. medieval artists couldn't, couldn't stand there in front of these amazing images and just copy them, you know, to the letter. They had to, to draw them from afar and then bring them into the studio. And, you know, and so this was, th that would create a, just a natural transformation without a, without a desire to be in, to create innovation. It would just happen on its own because you can't yeah. completely remember the thing you exactly. saw in the cathedral. Point. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They to internalize it. They saw it for half an hour. Then you know, three months later, they'd get back home and they'd paint it. So they'd have to internalize that image. And of course, that would mean that they were translating. And I've done some translating from Greek into English. And it's quite a creative act. You know, you're translating um, a content rather than a word. You know. Yeah. And so one of the things that you've also been known for, I think that, you know, we, we talk about you as an iconographer, as an icon carver, but you your, your work spans much more than that. You You've designed churches, you design liturgical objects. You're really more 
a liturgical designer. And so I'd like to know a little bit about how you see this coming together because there's something there's something different about, let's say, designing a reliquary or designing a, a church and, and the icon itself. And so maybe you can speak a little bit to how this, these different languages come together in, in the experience of orthodoxy in a, like, as a European, like as an English person, you know, to, to be able to create these, these spaces that are, you know, you've created iconostases with icons on them. And I've seen you done everything from a bishop's staff to, to uh, you know, to reliquaries. Uh, how do you decide or how do you kind of pull in your different influences when you are creating things? Hmm. Um, I suppose I'll start with place first. You know, where is this place? I've done work for a church in Madrid and another in Amsterdam. So for example, the stone icon screen I made for the church of St. Nicholas in Amsterdam. There are a lot of different cultures there. So in the... Um, the roughly one meter by one meter, three foot by three foot stone plaques underneath the icons. I made designs that reflected the different cultures there. There's Anglo-Saxon, there was something more from the Netherlands, something that was Russian, something that was Greek. So I start with the actual place. I think place is important. You know, the, the God is kind of in that place. Um, and, and the fire of, of, of the burning bush is, is in that particular bush, you know. It's, it's a, it, it wasn't a bush brought in from England that, was, that Moses saw. It was a, a, a it was an Egyptian bush that was burning. Um, so I, I research the um, the art of that culture, um, um, and I suppose this is discernment where discernment is quite required. You know what what is usable in that culture, what isn't. Um, a slight deviation, but it does express what I'm saying. That Saint Nicholas of Japan, to my mind, is the great one of the great missionaries because for seven years. He just studied Japanese culture, you know, and he really gained, got a respect for it. So after about seven years, he began to speak to people about the faith. And then when Japanese converted, they realized that they're actually converting to Christ, not to being a Russian. He was able to embed the faith in Japan. So, but all that required quite a bit of research and, a, and, and an appreciation of the Japanese culture. So that's the first thing, research really. Um, and secondly, this object, it might be relic or whatever, is, I realize it can be part of a, a larger symphony and it's got to work with that symphony. And I think this is why I got involved in so many different media that I feel I'm here to serve the church, serve Christ and the worship. And that requires a certain unity of worship. And I think we've suffered too much from you know, this iconographer will then put an icon painted on the wall and you get an, uh, a, uh, another person from another place to do the icon screen. It doesn't fit, but you know, he, He's Romanian, so he'll do a Romanian one or whatever, or he's Greek, so he'll do a Greek screen. So you get this incredible, incredible mishmash. And this upsets me. You know, I feel there's no, just aesthetically, you know, I just feel there's <laughs> no attempt to make a uniform, uh, a beautiful thing that dances together. You know, everyone's just jamming, doing their own thing. It's cacophony. Um, so I, I think it's out of that that has felt compelled to try to you know, respond to the need and, and get involved in different media. Um, I'm actually going to be working on a novel soon, partially out of the desire to create a church. I probably would never be able to design and, and make a whole church. So in this novel, it's all about this process of this man who's, um, who, 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 whose uncle is called into the reading of his will. And the uncle was a very wealthy man um, and he made a vow to God to build a church. Um, but he got cancer and he knows he's not going to have time to build it. So in his will, he says to his um his nephew, I'm giving all my wealth to you um, as long as you build a church, this church for this monastery, and then you can have the rest of the money. And the whole novel goes on about the process of him and other people changing and the process of not just building the building, but decorating it inside. Um, so yeah, I suppose the basis of it is that you're not just creating an individual liturgical art object, but you're creating a symphony. And that symphony um, it, it's an improvisation in the sense that God just doesn't drop from heaven a complete score and your job is just to play it. He, he sets a sort of theme and you improvise on that. So yeah, each improvisation this... is unique. You're going to improvise in Canada in a different way. But we're singing this from the same sort of, um, not tune, but the same theme that Christ has given to us both. Yeah, there's definitely, I, I love the, the images you use. I think that really theme and variation is exactly the way to, to, to see it, you know, and that there is this, 
there has always been because we, we we're so polar in the way we think. You know, we we tend to think of tradition as something which is completely solid and completely fixed. And then we have the idea of the modern world, which is idiosyncratic and improvisational. But when you look at, like you said, the great uh, iconographers, you see this strange play between the messiness and, uh, you know, and a desire to be in tune with the, the, the inner music, let's say, or the hidden music. Um, one of the biggest difficulties, I think one of the biggest questions, this is a very practical question, but it, it's not it, there's also something theological in the question, let's say, is that many of us, like, let's say, my example of the parish where I am, you know, the parish where we, we are, we are renting from a Catholic church. And so we have this space, which is a 1960s Catholic church, you can imagine, you know, what that means. Um, and we, we're taking over from a Romanian uh, church that was there before. And, you know, for all my love of them and respect of them, they put up an iconostasis, which is as if like an extraterrestrial ship had come down. You know, it's Baroque. It, it, you know, it's, it's highly ornamented and it's spray painted and it has, you know, all of that. And so what is your advice to people who are in spaces which are not liturgically conducive in the outset? How can you, what kind of advice you have to, for people who are in spaces that are ugly or that are look like strip malls or, you know, how is it that you can, without, like I said, without creating this strange disjunct, you know, how can we adapt our, our work to, to these kinds of spaces? Yeah. Sorry for the hard question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think these places got to be taken in the same merits, and sometimes it's damage limitation. It's a bit, probably more often than not, it's damage limitation. It's probably impossible to make something really beautiful. But I think the first principle is be appropriate to space. You know, don't force it to be something that it isn't. There's one parish I know where they, they bought a, um, a Methodist church, which is uh, just a re rectangle, really. Um, no, I think they should have treated that a bit like a basilica, you know. But what they did was they created inside um, a, a, a four-column dome church out of plasterboard. You know, and once you, if you're blindfolded and walk in, oh, it's really nice. You go outside, oh, that's rather weird. Um, so I think that, that that was being dishonest to what was there. It would have been better to think, okay, this is like a basilica, um, you know, basically a rectangle. Let's work with that. You know? um, so I think authenticity. So if it is just a 1960s white wall geometrical thing or circular, whatever it is, then well, let's make the best of, of that. It's a limitation, but let's make the limitation our strength. I think that's the first thing to listen. I think often we don't listen enough to the space. You know, we just jump in and do what we saw done in Greece or Romania. So I think listen a lot. If you just worship in a place, look at it and think, okay, well, you know, what can this place teach me? You know, what are its strengths, its weaknesses? How can I capitalize? It might just be one strength. Um, how can I capitalize on that? Um, beyond that, I think that's all I can say at the moment. Yeah, I, I, you've got I, to take I, each place as it goes. Sometimes you can put it in reverse and take things out. Hmm. Um, that can be a pastoral challenge because um, we've always had that, and you know, Joe Bloggs gave it to us, and it'd be an insult to take it out. So that's the job of the priest, really, to really gradually educate the priest. The, the icon skin I made for Amsterdam, the priest was brilliant there. He, I think, a lot of the Russians are expecting a high Russian screen. Hmm. So about a year before we, we did the work, he had in the back a whole, and had talks and all that about the history of the icon screen. And mm -hmm. he had this display in the back with photographs. So gradually people realized actually the Russian icon screen with five stories was actually quite a late thing. So in fact, you know, having this one layered screen is actually quite traditional. So there's often a lot of education that is needed, patient education into history more often than not, not just theology, but history. You know, how has the church in the past dealt with it? So education and humility and listening, I think, are, are things that can all help. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Because I think this is, at least in America, it's definitely a struggle that many parishes have because, you know, we end up in these very odd spaces. And the, the temptation to create, you know, for example, like you said, to have a flat ceiling, but then put a sticker of, of Christ Pantocrator, you know, and on the ceiling, uh, even it's, sometimes it's even a low, it's not very high, you know, it's not oh, even that totally. high. 
It's yeah. like 12 feet high, but there's this, there's this, you know, instead of really kind of, but it's hard because the space is ugly. So mm-hmm. when you say, listen, it's difficult. We don't want to, you know, because we, we actually don't have a lot of love for the space, but I, I, I see what you're saying really, even in a way, maybe the way to approach popular culture in general or, or, or modern culture, which is that in order, this is something that, that I, I think that in order for something to exist, there has to be at least some seed. There has to be, there has to be some seed, which is making it exist. Mm -hmm. And so if we're patient and attentive and we, we watch, we can find these little, these little, these little sparks, let's say, sometimes Mm -hmm. they're very small and sometimes they're very hard to find, but they, they kind of have to be there or else, yeah, or else we, we, we wouldn't even be able to perceive it, you know. But I think um, sometimes we've got to acknowledge that one generation is is not beyond salvation, but you're not going to find much good in that. So you've got to think ahead. What about the next generation? So what I'm talking about here is future purpose-built orthodox architecture. And at the moment, most of the orthodox churches I've seen in America just don't work. You know, they put, oh, orthodox church got a dome. They put a dome on. They've got arches. Let's have arches. But tell me, we don't understand at all what we're doing. Acoustically, for example, I, I, when I was doing work in um, Houston, Texas, I was talking to a priest there about domes. And he said, not one purpose-built Orthodox church have I been to in this country, which has good acoustics, you know. And he said, we don't, under, we, out of our hubris, we haven't really studied Byzantine churches properly. Um, and, but I did read a very good um, article by uh, an Orthodox man who's an acoustic engineer for NASA, he knows his stuff. And this article was outlining some principles of good um acoustics and often they're surprising you know right angles is not a good thing flat floors isn't a good thing i think one of the reasons why we're finding it difficult to make successful contemporary architecture is the materials we use um unfortunately concrete is here to stay but um with stone you've got to have an arch if you want to have you know a roof that's out of stone you've got to have an arch so all these shapes arose out of the weakness of the materials um and they're natural and they work well but concrete doesn't necessarily need an art. Sometimes you do, but sometimes. But we've got this material, reinforced concrete, that's really strong. Doesn't have many limitations, um, but we pretend that it's something that it isn't. So I think we need to think ahead and figure out, well, what are the principles of good orthodox architecture? What can be changed? What make, makes most old orthodox architecture work consistently? Mm. So we need to be thinking one or two generations ahead. You know, really get serious about this. You know, Orthodox churches and Orthodox have got a dome on top. Um, and, and I think we really need to look into this um, and, and do some serious thinking. And um, yeah, we've got a lot yeah. of work in here with us. A lot of Even work. in terms of culture, I think what you're saying is true. That is, there's, you know, I, I, there's something, this is, I get, this is one of the reasons why we started the Orthodox Art Journal at the outset, is that we realized that it was the seminarians that we had to talk to in a way no. that, that we wanted to create something, a vehicle of, uh, to, to, show the, to show beauty, to show adaptation, to show all these things. And our target was not mm-hmm. so much the older priests, but thank, thank God if they, if they can hear it, but it was really to affect the seminarian so that, you know, ten, and I, we're seeing it now, you know, Andrew Gould, if 10 years ago, you know, was, with his, the balance of his work, he was struggling to get liturgical commissions. Now, he he gets them every, he, he has to refuse them you know and mm-hmm. so you can see that the transformation is slowly happening of course it's not it's not complete there's still a lot of work to do but we can see the the fruits of the seeds that we planted and that you, that you planted you know you know 10 years ago 15 years ago are starting to to appear in the culture and so yeah. and I, I think there's a lot to be grateful for that yes yeah, so i was approached by um the chancellor of Chichester cathedral i made a cathedral in the south of england to help them start a liturgical arts center. Um, so I said, that's fine. I've, I myself can't do a lot with the practical training of liturgical artists. It wasn't just icons, the whole thing. But my two apprentices, um, they can go down and be the core of the practical training. But I said, I don't want us just to look at training the liturgical artists, but I want to look at training future priests, or well, ideally also contemporary priests, but most of them already set in their ways, because the commissioners need to be educated, I said, as much as the makers of liturgical art, because um, 
A, a lot of them don't realise the importance of liturgical art. They think liturgical art is just getting a painter to paint something that's sort of a sacred subject, but it's, it's how it's done which affects the soul as much as what is done. Like you can't, you know, sing the psalms to rock music and, and, and liturgy. It might be great rock music, but it doesn't help prayer. Same words, but have the same words to Byzantine and Gregorian chant, have a different effect on the soul. So you've got to train the commissioners, which is basically the, the priests. And I think they've got to go hand in hand. I, I'm just astounded that Orthodox priests and Anglican and Catholic are all talking the same thing, that their seminarian training doesn't have any compulsory training in, in liturgical art or liturgical beauty. I thought, you know, what converted Russia? You know, that's right, most exactly. People, first of all, to orthodoxy, normally some aspect of the beauty of it, that's the fragrance. Then they find, well, where does this fragrance come from? But the thing that stimulates them longing is beauty, but you've got nothing there in the liturgical, in, in the seminary and training. I think something's wrong here. So I'm, and this I'm, needs I'm a, for, for every for, theological academy to have a compulsory, at least one day, you know, after three years, one day, please, where you give them a taste of the importance of liturgical art. I think that's I think that's so true. Uh, and there is a these there is here in America we're kind of seeing a little bit. I don't know how it's integrated into the semin the, the seminars, but we're seeing you know Saint Vladimir is developing this this arts uh, kind of art center that it, I mean it's not it's not a practical it's more theoretical but that's okay because they're priests but you know a and you can see it at St. Econ's as well they want to have a kind of art center so I think it's it's coming it's burgeoning uh but we yeah we definitely need to encourage it and to all you I know a lot of seminarians will be watching this you know you need to put pressure on your own seminaries as well you know to yeah. make sure that you're able to to get a uh and, and like Aiden said the you know, I'm seeing it, the people that are attracted to orthodoxy through the things that I'm saying, it really is the beauty which is attracting them. The, you know, the beauty, you know, of the scriptures, the beauty of how this integrates into the liturgical life, you know, these, these powerful patterns that show us that the world is meaningful, that the world is, is actually leading us towards God if we are capable of engaging with it and paying attention to it in the proper manner. And so, so you know, I think you're completely right. I, um, when I was in my hermitage, a, a priest uh, came with his parishioners to talk about things. And I did a, deliberately said something that I knew that would, would shock the priest. And I said to the, the parishioners, look, and they're all converts, I said, forget that orthodoxy. It's life with Christ. You know, orthodoxy is just a name. And orthodoxy, Anglican, all that. I mean, I know orthodoxy is, is the fullness of the truth. But it's, the thing is that you're a human being before God. Forget all the oxies and the isms. And beauty, this is the thing in beauty, it doesn't have an ism or an oxism. It's the beauty affects your soul profoundly. I remember when I um, was doing up the hermitage, it was a bit run down this 20 acres of property and I had to do a lot of work on it. And I converted half the uh, barn into a chapel and frescoed it and um, made a, a wooden mosaic floor and, and such like. Anyway, there's still work to be done and the, I'd get uh, 10 tons of, of gravel delivered or sand and there's one day this big truck comes up and it's a really wild place. It was up in the hills. There's a big muscly man with tattoos all over, delivers the truck and he delivers the sand. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm making a hermitage. I said, I'll show you the chapel. And this guy sort of walks into the chapel and he just stood there, didn't say anything. And I saw he began to cry, mm. you know, just began to weep. And I didn't say anything, you know, he wasn't a religious man, I think, but it just, just touched him, just beauty touched him. So it was just one person, he didn't know about orthodoxy or anything, it didn't matter, you know, he, did, he met God in that place. So I think we, we just have to go back to the basics, you know, it's all to do with life as a human being on this earth and God's wonderful creation, loving God and, and beauty is the fragrance that comes out of that loving one another and, and loving Christ. Well, Aiden, I think that's a really wonderful place to to uh, to finish our conversation. Thank you so much for the encouragement and for your wisdom, and also thank you for your work. You know, I I know how much influence you have, and you know you 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 remain you remain humble and uh, and discreet. But I know that so many iconographers have been influenced by you, and not just that, but just as a person. You know, uh, for me as well, I want to thank you for the 
the advice you gave me at the outset, you know, when I started and just knowing that you were there, I could always send you things when I was, when I was struggling with some images, I've always sent you, you know, some, some carvings to get your opinion. And, and even sometimes you've been harsh on me with some, you might not remember, but there's sometimes when you said, you know, stop doing it this way. And I was like, well, you know, I think he's right. And so <laughs> I've actually changed the way that I carve because of your advice. And so thank you for, thank you for also talking to the people for, I'm happy that people are able to discover you a little more. Everybody that's watching this, please uh, go online. You will find several books uh, by Aiden. You, if you go on Amazon, you will, you will discover his writing, his work on the Orthodox Art Journal. You'll, there's several articles by him and also you'll see some of his projects. So Aiden, thank you for your time and, and for being here with me. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been a joy to, to talk with you. <laughs>